So here's the truth you need to focus on right now. When you unite God's power with God's purpose, you enter a new level of anointing. God is always ready to back up his purpose with his power. When you align with his purpose, you are guaranteed the power of God. Five hundred years ago, a famous artist named Michelangelo set out to accomplish an ambitious project. He wanted to create a statue of the biblical hero David and to show him as a young man tending sheep. So Michelangelo began with a huge piece of solid marble from which he could carve the image of David. Then he set to work. The work was tedious and exacting. Michelangelo had to carve the entire statue out of one solid block of rock. He knew that one mistake, one false blow of the hammer could ruin the entire work. He spent years with a hammer and chisel, chipping away at the stone, fashioning and forming the figure of David. Carefully, gradually, the image of David appeared from the stone. When it was finished, it was a beautiful and perfect work of art, which is admired even to this day. It is considered one of the greatest works of sculpture in history. Legend has it that after he was finished, Michelangelo was asked how he had accomplished creating such a masterpiece out of one single block of stone. He replied, I saw the vision of David in the stone. I looked at the stone and I could picture David in my mind's eye. Then he said, I hammered and chiseled away everything that was not David till only David was left. The greatest statue ever carved was formed by first seeing the vision of the image in the stone, then removing everything that did not match that vision. In the same way that Michelangelo saw David in the rock and removed everything till only David stood, so God is working in us to transform us. God has a beautiful vision of your life. He sees what no one else can see. He sees you in the image of Christ. He sees you whole and complete. He sees you full of life and love and grace and peace. He sees a beautiful you that accomplishes all you were created to accomplish. He sees a you that is all that he wants you to be. And if you will see that same vision of your life, you can work with God to produce a masterpiece from your life. You can accelerate his work in you so that you enter a new level of anointing, power, and purpose. For the fact is, you have to see what God wants to show you in order to get where God wants to take you. The sharper your vision, the sharper your outcome. The better you see the end result, the better you will achieve it. That's the lesson prophet Elisha wants to teach us today. As we continue our sermon series, Double Double, we're going to look at three stories from the life of Elisha that teach us how to have a vivid vision for our lives. But before we go further, let us bow our heads and pray. Almighty and everlasting Father, we thank you today that you have a beautiful vision for every life. We ask you now to open our eyes that we might see that vision and align our lives, our activities, and our thinking with your vision for our lives. We submit to you now, we bind every voice of the enemy that would come to deceive or disturb or distract us. And in the name of the Lord Jesus, I loose the power of the Holy Spirit, the power to enlighten our hearts and minds and give us vivid vision. We thank you by faith in Jesus' name and everybody said amen. I want to invite you to take a moment to join your faith with mine. Put your hand on your chest and pray after me, Lord Jesus, speak to my heart. Change my life. Manifest your glory in me. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to Truth For Today. It's great to have you with me as we continue our sermon series dubbed Double Double. Everybody say Double Double. For the last few weeks, we've been studying the story of Elisha, one of the greatest prophets who ever lived. In fact, the Bible records more miracles in Elisha's ministry than any other person in history except for Jesus Christ. 
And the reason Elisha performed so many miracles is because he was hungry for more. He had a vision of doing greater things for God than anyone else. So when his mentor Elijah was about to depart for heaven and leave the ministry in Elisha's hands, Elisha prayed a bold, faith-filled prayer. He asked God for a double portion of anointing. And God answered his prayer. He is the double, double prophet because he received a double portion. And today, we can learn how to have a double portion in our own lives when we follow the example of prophet Elisha. So let's take a moment to review what we've learned so far from Elisha's life. In our first lesson, we learned that Elisha obtained a double portion because he possessed courageous commitment. See, courageous commitment puts you in the position of God's favor. Your faithfulness to God attracts the attention of heaven and launches you into the double portion. Then in week two, we took the next step and learned about peculiar provision. Peculiar provision teaches you how to participate in your miracle. Last week we saw that the widow woman had to participate in her miracle. She had to expect much more. She had to shut the door and she had to start to pour. God took her to a whole new level and she got her need met and her life back on track. And while that's a good thing, I believe that's not all there is to live a double, double life. I believe that God doesn't want to just visit us. He wants to dwell with us. For you see, when God visits you, then miracles take place occasionally in your life. But when God dwells with you, you live every day in the supernatural realm. That's why today we're going to discover the third element we need in order to live a double, double life. Elisha beckons us deeper into the double, double life by pushing us towards vivid vision. See, when you possess vivid vision, you move into a a new realm where you begin to see the supernatural on a regular daily basis. Vivid vision takes you to the next level in the double, double life where the miraculous becomes a common occurrence in your life. Now, to help us learn how to experience vivid vision, we prepared sermon notes. The notes are available for free on my website and on my Facebook page and YouTube channel. I invite you to take out your notes and follow along with me as we learn the three levels of vivid vision. And there at the top of your notes is our scripture text for today. It's found in Proverbs 29, 18. I want to ask you to read it out loud together with me. Read it like you believe it. Here we go. Three, two, one, go. Where there is no vision, the people perish. May the Lord bless the reading of his word to your hearts in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Our scripture text is a well-known verse. You may have read it before yourself. You may have heard it. You may even love this verse. But today, I want you to think carefully about what God is really telling us in this verse. It's telling us that when you lose your vision, you lose life. You may be alive in the physical realm, but you're missing the double, double life Jesus promised when you have no vision. But the opposite is also true. When you possess vision, you possess life. In fact, the greater vision brings greater life. So here's the truth you need to pack up and take home with you today. What you see today will determine what you experience tomorrow. The right vision always leads to the right outcome. So today we're going to study three stories from Elisha's ministry that teach us about the three levels of vivid vision. Elisha had three major episodes of vivid vision in his ministry. Each vision was a higher level than the previous one. And here's your first vision today, a vision of God's power. Elisha's first level vision can be discovered in the story of the trapped Arameans. The story is found in 2 Kings 6, 13 to 17. In this passage, the enemy king of Aram set out to capture Elisha. He knew that Israel's victory of his army was due to the anointed prophet Elisha. So he set out to capture the prophet by sending soldiers to surround the city where Elisha was staying. And in the morning, when Elisha's servant got up, he saw the army of the enemy with their horses and their chariots surrounding the whole town. And he panicked. He ran to Elisha and said, what are we going to do? We're finished. 
But listen to what the prophet said. Elisha said, don't be afraid. The army that fights for us is larger than the army that fights for Aram. Then Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I ask you, open my servant's eyes so that he can see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man. And the servant saw that the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire. Everybody say fire. They were all around Elisha. So here in this first story, we see Elisha's first vision is a vision of God's power. He saw into the spiritual realm and he understood the foundational truth that God is greater than any other power. He saw that there are more spiritual forces with us than with our enemies. It doesn't mean that the enemy is not there. It simply means we do not fear what the enemy will try to do. For we know that God always wins in the end because God... God is always greater than the enemy. If you believe it, say amen. And this is the starting point for the double-double life. You have to have a vision of the presence and the power of God. You can't receive anything from God unless you believe that God is who he says he is. For Hebrews eleven six 6 says, it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. Many people today have an intellectual idea about God's power, but that's not the same as a vision of God's power. Our eyes must be open today to see the reality that God is who he says he is and that he can do what he says he can do. And the good news is it's not beyond your reach. No matter your level of faith, you can begin to get this initial level of vision. And here's what you need to know in order to begin building vivid vision in your life. What you look at is what you see. That's what the Bible teaches us in Proverbs eleven twenty seven. 27. Listen to this powerful truth. He who looks for good finds favor, but he who looks for wrongdoing will have bad come to him. In other words, what you look at is what you will see and what you'll obtain. We know this to be true because we say it in everyday life. After all, we've all likely said that very thing. If someone says to us, did you see that man on the street? We might answer, no, I didn't see him. I wasn't looking. What you look at is what you will see. This truth reminds me of the story of the old man and his granddaughter who were sitting by the roadside in their community when a stranger walked up and greeted them. The man was hoping to move into that community, but he wanted to know what the people in that town were like. The grandfather asked what the people were like in his last neighborhood, and the stranger said, oh, the people where I come from are very, very bad. I don't like them at all. That's why I want to move to a new place. Then the old grandfather said, well, I'm sorry to say, but you'll find the people here in this community are just like the people where you came from. They're also very bad. So the stranger went away. Then a second man came along. He also stopped and greeted the grandfather and the granddaughter. He also told them he was considering moving to that community, and he wanted to know what the people in the town were like. So the grandfather also asked the second stranger what the people were like in his last neighborhood. And the stranger said, oh, the people where I come from, they are very, very good. In fact, I don't want to leave that place. But because of my work, I'm forced to move, so I'm considering coming here. Then the old grandfather said, well, I'm happy to say that you'll find the people here in this community are also very, very good. They're just like the people where you're coming from. So the stranger thanked him and left. After the second stranger left, the granddaughter looked at her grandfather and said, Grandpa, why did you answer the two men the way you did? Aren't you contradicting yourself? You told the first man that our people are bad, and you told the second man our people are good. Then the grandfather said, no, my dear, I'm being quite honest, for the truth in life is this. You will find what you see. If you look at the bad, that's all you'll see. If you look at the good, that's what you'll see. And this is the problem with many of us. We don't see the good, so we don't experience good. We don't look for the good in our season, so we don't see the good 
in our season. And the problem for many of our marriages is a wrong vision. All you look for is the bad, so that's all you see. And the more bad you see, the more bad you expect. Eventually, you don't see anything good in your spouse. It's the same for churches and workplaces. We need a vision shift. The problem is not your spouse or your circumstances. The problem is what you're looking at. What you look at is what you see. See, the problem is that we've trained ourselves to see evil. We watch and listen to the news, and most of it is bad. You hear about an accident on the road. 24 people died on the spot, and you start seeing death. The currency devalues 26%, and you start thinking, how am I going to make it? You read about tainted cooking oil that killed seven family members in a village far from you, and you start looking at all the food like it's going to kill you. Fighting breaks out over a chieftaincy dispute in another region, and you start worrying about something somewhere that has nothing to do with you. You get fearful and nervous and worried, and you start seeing evil everywhere. I'm not saying those news reports aren't real. I'm not asking you to deny reality. But what I'm saying is if all you look at is evil, that's all you'll see. You have to look at the good to see the good. You have to keep your eyes on God's power to see God's power at work in your life. This is what happened to Elisha's servant. Times were difficult in Israel. The people were not following God. The enemy was having a field day in the camp of Israel. And when enemy soldiers surrounded them, Elisha's servant was so used to seeing the bad that all he could see was bad. He looked at the negative and all he saw was negative. He looked at the problems and all he saw was problems. He looked at the enemy and all he could see was the enemy's power. He became afraid because of what he focused on. So Elisha prayed, Lord, open his eyes to see. Let him see that there are more with us than against us. In other words, let him see your power. Let him see your presence. Let him see that no matter what the enemy brings, you, God, are greater still. Elisha saw into the spiritual realm and understood the foundational truth that God is greater than any other power. He saw that there are more spiritual forces with us than with our enemies. It doesn't mean the enemy's not there. It simply means we do not need to fear what the enemy is trying to do. For we know that God always wins in the end. Somebody say amen. That's why Apostle John wrote in 1 John 4.4, 4, My dear children, you belong to God and have defeated them. Because God's spirit who is in you is greater than the devil who's in the world. John doesn't deny the presence of the enemy, but he tells us the greater reality. God's power always supersedes the power of Satan. And I'm here to tell you that if you'll look at God, you'll see God. If you'll focus on his power and presence, that's what you'll start to experience in your life. You'll move into a whole new realm of faith and power. Look for evidence of God's presence and you'll see it everywhere. Look for evidence of evil, you'll see that everywhere. So you need to pray today for God to open your eyes to see the great and many ways that he is moving in the world today. For no matter how bad the world becomes, no matter how the economy falters, no matter how the wars arise, God is still on the throne. He rules and reigns and he knows how to keep his people in the time of trouble before Christ returns to earth the second time. Every nation will hear. Every tribe will be impacted by the gospel. There will be children of God redeemed from among every people on earth. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 28, 18, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So whose report will you believe? Which vision do you choose to follow? You must begin with the foundational vision of God's power. This is where most people are at. But in order to enter the double-double life, we have to move beyond the vision of God's power to the next level of vision. And that brings us to Elisha's second vision, a vision of God's purpose. 
Elisha's second level of vision is seen in the story of the siege of Samaria found in 2 Kings chapter 6 and 7. See, Elisha's story continues with a worse problem than the first one. The Bible tells us that the king of Aram has now not just surrounded Elisha and his servant, the king of Aram and his army have surrounded the capital city of Israel. They've gone to the very seat of power and they've laid siege to Samaria and the people are starving. The Bible says this, it was so bad in Samaria that a donkey's head was sold for 80 pieces of silver and one pint of dove's dung sold for five pieces of silver. The people are suffering. The people are starving. But Elisha sees what no one else sees. He sees God's power providing God's provision for God's purpose. Listen to 2 Kings 7, 1. Elisha said, listen to the message from the Lord. The Lord says, about this time tomorrow, there will be plenty of food and it will be cheap again. A person will be able to buy a basket of fine flour or two baskets of barley for only one shekel in the marketplace by the city gates of Samaria. And that's exactly what happened. 2 Kings 7, 17 tells us, so everything happened just as the man of God had said. During the siege of Samaria, Elisha didn't focus on the problems at hand. He focused on God's plan. He understood what God wanted to do for the purpose and plan of God overruled Elisha's current circumstances. And the same thing is true in your life. No matter what you see around you right now, in your marriage, in your job, in your church, in your nation, God's plan and purpose supersedes whatever is happening. So here's the truth you need to focus on right now. When you unite God's power with God's purpose, you enter a new level of anointing. God is always ready to back up his purpose with his power. When you align with his purpose, you are guaranteed the power of God. That's what we see in the New Testament church. In Acts 5, 12, the Bible says, the apostles were given the power. Everybody say power. They were given the power to do many miraculous signs and wonders among the people. They were together in Solomon's porch and they all had the same purpose. Everybody say purpose. So they had the power of God to do miracles because they were pursuing the purpose of God. Then verse 14 tells us the result of this unity of power and purpose. More and more people believed in the Lord and many men and women were added to the group of believers. God's power operates to fulfill God's purpose. And that's what happened to Elisha. He had a vision of God's purpose. He saw what God wanted to do. That's why in spite of the famine, in spite of the enemy, he said there will be plenty. In spite of the struggle, he said it will be good. In spite of the difficulty, there would be deliverance. He saw anointing. He saw deliverance. He saw abundance. He saw freedom. He saw power. And that's the vision of God's purpose you need right now. No matter who you are or where you come from, you can see God's power for this world when you see Jesus. For Jesus shows us the vision of God's purpose. See, the Bible says that Jesus only did what he saw the Father doing. In John 5, 19, Jesus answered, I assure you, the Son can do nothing alone. He does only what he sees his Father doing. The Son does the same things that the Father does. So Jesus, every act on earth, was only at the command of the Father. All that Jesus did gives us a picture of God's purposes. And you can see God's power achieving God's purpose when you see Jesus. So what do you see when you see Jesus? See a group of children running up the hill. Their noses are running with snot. Their faces are dirty. Their rags are in tatters, but they're laughing when they run up the hill. They're laughing because they're coming, coming to see Jesus. See Peter stand in the way, his arms folded. Go back, go back. The master's too busy for you, Peter says. But then see Jesus push Peter aside. 
see Jesus kneel down and embrace the children. Their snotty nose right wipes against his tunic. Their dirt gets on his trouser, but he doesn't care. He laughs along with them because the lowly and the poor and the insignificant are always important to Jesus. See the angry crowd. Their faces are tight. Their fists are clenched. They're carrying stones. And they're dragging a woman out onto the pavement. Her hair is disheveled. Her eyes are filled with fear. Her knees are bloody from being dragged by force from the bedroom. This woman was caught in adultery. The crowd wants blood. The crowd wants vengeance. But see Jesus kneel down. And begin to write. See the crowd drop their stones and leave. See Jesus tell the woman, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. See Jesus and see God's purpose. See the ten lepers. They've been cast out from their own homes. They're sick. They're dying. They've lost everything and they're crying out, Jesus, help us. And see Jesus do what no one else in the world would do. See him call them close. See him touch them and heal them and love them. Because the lowly, the sinful, the rejected, the hurting, the sick, Jesus loves them all. When you see Jesus, you see what God wants to do. He wants to embrace the poor. He wants to forgive the sinner. He wants to heal the sick. He wants to save our world. He wants to use God's power to achieve God's purpose. The prophet Ezekiel saw what God wanted to do. He prophesied about the river of God's anointing. He said, I see a river that is the power of God that brings healing to the nations. In chapter 47, he said, the Holy Spirit told me to go into the river, and I went in, and it was to my ankle. And the Holy Spirit said, go in deeper. And I went in deeper, and it was to my knees. And the Holy Spirit said, go in deeper. And I went in deeper, and the water was to my waist. And the Holy Spirit said, go in deeper. And I went in deeper until I was swimming in the mighty river, swimming in the river of God's power, swimming in the river of God's life and anointing. And in verse 9, the Bible says, where the river flows, everything will live. God wants us to flow in that power. And when you see what God wants to do, you can believe him for his power. The apostle John saw what God wanted to do. In Revelation 7, 9 to 10, he said, after this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne in front of the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. The church saw it. Ezekiel saw it. John saw it. Do you see it? Do you see what God wants to do in the world today? For if you will see the invisible, God will do the impossible. God wants to open your eyes to see the world. That's what Jesus said in John 4, 35. I'm telling you to open your eyes and take a good look at what's right in front of you. These fields are ripe. It's harvest time. And you must move beyond the vision of God's power to understand and see his purpose. You have to move beyond believing that everything centers around your personal comfort and happiness. For God wants to bring deliverance. He wants to bring revival. And here's what you need to understand. The purpose of God's power is not just to bless you. The purpose of God's power is to take your life to a new level of blessing where you bless others. For the double-double life isn't just about you being blessed. It's about you being blessed so you can be a blessing. And Elisha sees what we all need to see today. God's power works in our world to alleviate suffering, to solve problems, and to deliver us from evil. See, our faith believes in the intersection of God's power with human predicament. We don't always know how or why. We can't always promise miracles for God is sovereign. But we must never doubt that he is a God who releases his power for a purpose, the help of mankind. That's why as long as there is one man without the gospel, we must press on for more of God and his power. As long as there is one village without a church, we must press on for more of God's 
power. As long as there's one sick man or one sick woman dying in a hospital alone, we must press on. As long as there's one orphan child without proper care, as long as one man dies without comfort, as long as one goes hungry, we must press on for more of God's power. We must rise in faith, believing there's more. We must rise in spiritual ambition and hunger for more. We must rise up in sacrifice, ready to pay the price. We must press on. We must not look back. We must not fail. We are the church, the people of God, and we're destined for such a time as this. We are the hope of the world. For the fact is God's power is released to accomplish his purposes through his people. And this brings us to our third level of vision, a vision of your potential. God wants to work through you in his power for his purpose. Just put your hand on your chest and say, God wants to work through me in power for his purpose. This was Elisha's third vision. At the end of his life, he knew that God wanted to pass on the power to another. Just as he had received power and anointing from Elijah when Elijah left the earth, so Elisha wanted to transfer that power and anointing to someone to carry on the ministry. So when the king of Israel comes to visit Elisha, he begins that process of transfer of anointing and power. But the king lacks a vision of his own potential. And he ends up short of the double-double life God planned for him. Listen to the story of Elisha's final vision in 2 Kings 13, 14 to 19. King Jehoash of Israel visited him and wept over him. My father, my father, I see the chariots and charioteers of Israel, he cried. Elisha told him, get a bow and some arrows. And the king did as he was told. Elisha told him, put your hand on the bow. And Elisha laid his own hands on the king's hands. Then he commanded, open that eastern window. And he opened it. Then he said, shoot. So he shot an arrow. Elisha proclaimed, this is the Lord's arrow, an arrow of victory over Aram, for you will completely conquer the Arameans at Aphek. Then he said, now pick up the other arrows and strike them against the ground. So the king picked them up and struck the ground three times. But the man of God was angry with him. You should have struck the ground five or six times, he exclaimed. Then you would have beaten Arab until it was entirely destroyed. Now you will be victorious only three times. See, at the end of his life, Elisha saw the possibilities. He saw the potential in Eli Israel's future. He saw what God wanted to do, and he sought to impact the nation after he was gone. But the king did not possess a vivid vision for spiritual potential. The king didn't see it, and he fell short of the fullness of what God wanted to do. And here's the lesson we all need to learn from him. You have to see something new to achieve something new. You have to see more than what you currently see in order to do more than what you're currently doing. You can't use the same old view and get a better result. God wants to open your eyes to see things from his viewpoint. That's why Paul prays for you and I in Ephesians 1, 18 to 20. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know, that you may see his incomparably great power for us who believe. See what God sees and you'll see opportunity. See what God sees, and you'll see what can be. See what God sees, and you'll see your potential. And when you move in the direction of your vision, God will move in greater ways than you can imagine. That's the lesson we can learn from a man named Bobby Grunwald. 14 years ago, Bobby had a vision to spread the word of God around the world. He knew how much the Bible had impacted his own life and his family. So he wanted to make it easier for other people around the world to access God's word. Realizing that smartphones and tablets had become commonplace, Bobby dreamed of developing an app for Bible reading. So Bobby and his church, Life Church in USA, developed YouVersion. YouVersion is a Bible software app that makes the Bible accessible on smartphones, on tablets, and computers. Bobby pursued a vivid vision of God's power, achieving God's purpose, and expanding his potential. And the result? 
In the last 14 years, version has had 500 million downloads. Last year, 1.4 billion Bible reading plan days were completed. Last year, 535 million Bible verses were shared from the YouVersion app. And today, the Bible is in 1,700 languages on YouVersion. The amazing success of YouVersion is a testimony to what happens when God's people dream big. One man had a vivid vision, and millions of lives have been changed. The double-double life will take you higher. You'll have a higher vision with a higher impact for a higher legacy. Don't settle for your current level of vision. Ask God to open your eyes to see his vivid vision for your future. For the more you see, the more you will do. The greater your vision, the greater your reach. That's why you need to see more. Let me add fuel to your vision today. Let me show you the greater things God wants to do in you today. For we know that there is more. The Bible says so. In Acts 3.21, listen carefully. Heaven must receive Jesus until the time when everything will be restored as God promised through his holy prophets long ago. Think about what the Apostle Peter is saying to us. As long as Jesus remains in heaven, we know there is more. We know that heaven must keep Jesus until everything is restored. So if Jesus is still in heaven, there remains a restoration of God's promise. If Jesus is still in heaven, there are still prophecies to be fulfilled. There are still works to be done. If Jesus is in heaven, there are still greater miracles waiting to happen. There are more songs to be written. There are more miracles to take place. There are more souls to be saved. There are more churches to be planted. There are more lives to be transformed. There are more orphans to be rescued. There is a greater outpouring of glory, and we need to see the vision God has for us as his people in these end times. We need to know that God has said the glory of the latter end will be greater than the glory of the former. For 2 Corinthians 3, 10 and 11 says, the glory of the old covenant is not Nothing compared with the far greater glory of the new. The glory of the low old lasts for only a short time. How much greater is the glory of the new? It will last forever. And I declare to you by faith, we will exceed the first church in power. We will exceed the book of Acts in miracles. We will see a greater harvest of souls, greater outpouring of power, greater transformations. We will see greater revival than ever in this generation. Every beer parlor can be closed. Every prostitute can repent. I see a vision of prisons shut down and empty because crime has ceased. I see a vision where no child is left alone on the street hungry. I see a vision of where corruption and bribery ends and end to hatred and racism where violence stops and love prevails. I see a vision of the supernatural power in the supernatural people of God acting like Jesus where the church lives holy and God's people are surrendered to his will. If you think that's impossible, You lack a vision of the greater potential in your life and in the church. So open your eyes to see what God sees. It's a vision of doing what Jesus did on earth and even more. It's a vision that involves you. That's why Jesus said in John 14, 12, I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works I've done and even Greater works because I'm going to be with the Father. We need to see God's vision of a greater work being done in and through us. We need to see that God has promised to pour out his spirit upon all flesh. We need to see a vision of our potential as God comes to fill us with his power. For the Lord speaks to you today from Joel 2, 28 to 29. After that, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will have visions. In those days, I will pour out my spirit on those who serve me, men and women alike. He has promised to pour out his spirit on all people, men and women, young and old, Africans, Americans, Chinese, and people from India. People from everywhere. In fact, anyone who serves the Lord 
will be a spirit-filled, God-empowered, world-changing arrow in the hands of God. You are that arrow. You face an open window and God has placed his power inside of you. If you see the vision of his power and his purpose and then see the vision of your potential, you will not stop short. You will not give up. You will not settle for anything less than God's very best. You will keep on fighting, keep chasing, keep serving, keep preaching, keep living holy, keep praying, keep believing, keep trusting, keep running, keep pressing for the goal. So let us heed the challenge today from the Apostle Paul in Philippians 3, 14 to 16. I've got my eye on the goal where God is beckoning us onward to Jesus. I'm off and running and I'm not turning back. So let's keep focused on that goal, those of us who want everything God has for us. If any of you have something else in mind, something less than total commitment, God will clear your blurred vision. You'll see it yet. Now that we're on the right track, let's stay on it. And I declare to you, there are opportunities God wants to give you if you won't give up. There are victories God wants to give you if you'll stay faithful. There are trophies and blessings and rewards God wants to shower on you. Just keep your vision vivid, your eyes clear, and your focus on Jesus. For if you want the double-double life, if you want it all in Christ keep focused on the goal. You'll see it. You'll see the prize. You'll see the goal and the reward ahead. God will clear your eyesight. He will give you vivid vision. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for everyone watching and listening today. I ask you to open their eyes, clear the blurred vision. Help us today to see exactly what you want us to see. Lord, change us. Give us a vision of your power. Give us a vision of your purpose. And give us a vision of our potential in you when we pursue your purpose and receive your power. We thank you by faith in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Thank you for joining me today on Truth For Today. I trust that this message has been a blessing to you. I've got a lot more great content to share with you to build your faith and help you to soar. So be sure to follow me on all my social media platforms. And don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel. When you do, click the notification bell so that you can get an alert when my new sermons drop. By God's grace, we're reaching people all over the world with truth for today. And the good news is, you can be a part of this outreach to glorify God and transform lives. When you sow into this ministry, you help us spread God's word to people everywhere. Join me in this ministry by hitting the donate button on my website. And of course, remember to share this message with your friends and your family. God richly bless you today. I'm praying for you and I look forward to seeing you next time on Truth For Today.